everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk. So my name is Maria, and for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to walk you through a problem my team and I have been trying to solve a few months ago. So during this presentation, I'm going to share with you some key concepts that are part of the solutions. Now, keep in mind that while I was working on this, I barely knew any of them. So what I'm sharing with you today is my learning path. And I really hope that by the end of this, everyone will have learned something new. So let's get started. You can't see, oh, it's fine. So a little bit about myself first. So I joined The Guardian almost two years ago as a graduate software re developer. Ever since, I changed teams three times as part of my rotations. I was first part of the content API team where I first introduced to Scala and functional programming. I then left the team seven months later to join the apps team where I used Objective-C and Swift. Uh, but then I just decided to go back to my first love, Scala. So now I'm part of the editorial tools team where together with my colleagues, we develop the tools our editorial team is using every day. So you can't see, but it says content atoms. So at The Guardian, you ha we have this concept of content atoms. So um, atoms are pieces of content that do not represent the page. Instead, they stand alone as individual elements. So atoms are structured data. Um, so by using atoms, we have the flexibility to build really richly structured content that fits both off-platform and our own tools. So let's quickly look at an example. These are three different Guardian articles, but they all have something in common. So they all have an atom embedded. It's very easy to spot in this case. It's just a blue box you see at the bottom. We call it an explainer. So the nice thing about this is that, for example, if there have been a typo or you want to change something, you can just do it once, and then you'll see the changes in all your articles in the same time. So we've built dedicated tools to support all of our types of atoms, and we are constantly being asked to support a new type of atom. But building a new tool every time a new atom is born is not sustainable. It takes our team around two months to build a, a tool from scratch, and that's a lot of development time. Plus, we started to notice the similarities and the patterns. They are all built on Scala, Play, and React, and they all use the same features and uh, the same services. So at the beginning of this year, we decided to build um, a tool that will become the home of all of our atoms. So a tool to rule them all. So we called it Atom Workshop, uh, and we decided to take our time to just experiment and implement all the features we, we need. So while building this tool, we faced many challenges. And one of them was building um, a generic API endpoint. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the idea behind it, and the reason why we want to do it, is collaborative editing. The scenario is very easy. So imagine someone wants to, to update an atom. And then somewhere else in the world, someone else wants to update the same atom without uh, them knowing about each other. By just using the common uh, update endpoint that just takes the uh, whole object and shoves it into the database, there's a very high risk that the two people will override the changes. So what we can do uh, instead is pull the database constantly for changes, and then when a change is detected, just use a, a specialized endpoint that updates that field in particular. So the only information we have is the path of the field, like you can see um, at the end of the URL, and then the new value that comes in the body of the request. So the trivial way to do it is write an endpoint for each field. But that is crazy, right? We would have ended up with like hundreds of endpoints. And even if we could have generated them somehow, why not just take advantage of the technologies that are out there? So our first instinct was to look at scalar reflection. But it soon proved to be difficult to understand. And because of the nesting of our classes, it was just hard to get all the information um, at the right time. Plus, it was quite slow for our thin lines of code that no one else could understand. Although, to be fair, we didn't fully understand ourselves. 
So our conclusion was, you can do cool stuff with reflection, but it takes time to master. And honestly, it looks scary. So we just moved on and never talked about it ever again. So after dropping color uh, reflection, someone mentioned Shapeless. So Shapeless is a, it's a cool library for generic programming in Scala. <clears throat> um, so Shapeless gives us the ability to convert from a concrete type to a generic representation. So a generic representation is an age list. An age list is a list where the type of every element is statically known at compile time. So think of, of them as tuples, but with heads, uh, tail, map, flat map, and all the other operations you normally have on lists, plus others. So the main application of age lists is abstracting over arity. By throwing away unimportant details, like the name of the case class, Shapeless makes it easier to focus on the similarities between types and implement generic code. So what you see on slide here is using the generic type class from Shapeless to convert from an ice cream type to a generic representation, which is an age list and has the type string int boolean and age nil just represents the end of the list. Um, again, you can't see my titles, I don't know why, but it says Thrift and Scrooge. So before um, diving into our first implementation, I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes to talk about this. Um, so Thrift is a software framework for cross-language development. So we are using Thrift at the Guardian because we want to define our mod models in a separate repo and then use Twitter's Scrooge library to generate the classes wherever we need them. And we don't usually care about how these generated classes look like. But while building this, we noticed that the generated classes had a lot of boilerplate, and they look very, very ugly and difficult to understand. And I tried to put an example on this slide, but it was way too long to fit, even for these three fields. So <clears throat> the reason why this was a problem it was because the generated classes are not case classes. And that is important because Shapeless knows how to generate uh, instances for algebraic data types like case classes and still traits. So we can use a little trick that we, we found. If you look very closely at the generated case classes, uh, sorry, the generated classes, you notice that they have inside a case class called the mutable. And we were able to define our own generic by using that information. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because making the three generated classes work, it was one of the things that took us the longest. And if you are working on something similar, or if you're, you'll ever try to make it work, maybe this will help. So I'm going to share with you at the end a repo with a code, so you can just take a look at yourself. So this is our first try at using Shapeless. The top part of the slide represents just some, uh, some classes that try to mimic the screw generated ones, hence the slightly over-engineered atom data. And then I'm just leaving out for the rest of the talk the immutable thing I just mentioned. I'm just going to assume that all the classes are already case classes. And then the bottom part is where the magic happens. So notice how we're using label generic to, to convert from a concrete type atom to a generic age list. So the difference between the generic uh, type class I've mentioned earlier and the uh, label generic I'm using here is that the latter offers more information uh, about uh, uh, the type we've just converted, like uh, the name of the fields. And then we can use a very nice syntax to update the title, and that works very nicely. But whenever we try to update a field that is nested, inside this structure, we are facing two issues. So the first one is that we cannot pass um, a variable to the symbols constructor because the magic happens at compile time. And um, the second is, at this point in the conversion, we don't have enough information about the types. And let's quickly look at this visual representation of the case uh, classes to understand why. So. As you can see, by using the label generic, only the, the layer below atom has been converted to an age list. 
So it's very easy to update the string fields at this level, but we haven't converted the atom data to um, an age list, so we can't update any fields inside it. So I've added um, in the bottom of um, this slide, I've added a fiddle link so we can play with this code, um, and maybe that will help you understand it better. So we weren't ready to give up shapeless yet, so we started Googling and researching, and we found this Stack Overflow question about converting um, nested his classes to nested maps. And that was really interesting, and we started wondering if that will help us solve our problem. So the top response was um, written by Travis Brown, you probably heard of him, and it looked very complicated um, at first, and it took us a while to fully understand it. But then we figured out maybe it's a good idea to take our case class, our atom case class, do some magic and convert it to an nested map from string 20, and then just write a recursive function to find the field we want to update, make the change, and then add some more logic to put it back um, into a case class. And that sounded very exciting, because you don't really get to do something like that in your day-to-day -day job. So I'm going to show you how we did it. Um, I'm not taking full credit for the idea, but uh, we've built on Travis's example to support more types. And um, I'm leaving out the actual update part, because that's the easy bit. Uh, before um, showing you the solution, I'll quickly mention type classes, because I've already mentioned them, and um, maybe some of you are not familiar with what they are and what you can do with them. So when I first saw a talk about type classes, I thought to myself, they were pretty cool, but a little bit too complicated for my level, but that was about one year ago, so yeah, they're not so scary anymore. Um, so I see type classes as uh, patterns used to define new behavior for types. The um, official definition is that um, type classes are a tool in functional programming to uh, enable ad hoc polymorphism. So all it takes to implement a type class is a trait that has some abstract behavior and then some implicit that implement behavior for your types. So let's discuss this very cat-friendly example. Um, so we have our type class in this example is greetings that has um, some abstract behavior message, and then inside its companion object, we define behavior for um, our human and cat um, case classes. And this behavior, these um, functions that define the behavior are always implicit. And then just for convenience, we define an implicit class, and that's just to make the call a little bit nicer later and as you can see, it works very nicely on humans and cats. I hope you can see it. Uh, but it fails on a dog case class because it can't find um, an implicit. So this is a very simple example um, of type classes. But I just hope I give you a taster because I don't have time to go into much detail. Cool. So this is um, our implementation. Well, just a small snippet of it. Um, this is um, the case that, hap that um, handles options. So we've used the type class pattern, and we've came up with a trait called to map rec that converts from an age list to a map from string 20. And then inside its companion object, we just define an implicit that handles the case when the, um, the head of the age list is an option of V, as you can see there. And it's very, very similar to what I showed you on the previous slide. Cool. So the only thing that is new and can be a little bit overwhelming is the bunch of implicits that we're using over there. But I can explain. So the first one, the witness implicit, we are using that one to fetch the name of the field. Uh, I won't get to go into detail on that one because that's not the important part. But the next one, the label generic one, is the implicit that assumes that we know how to convert from the type from within the option, so that's V, to a generic presentation. And then we have two more implicit that assume that we already know how to recursively convert the tail of the age list to a map from string 20, and one that does the same thing for the head of the age list. Cool. So now that we understand what the implicits do, the code kind of writes itself, 
And by just keeping in mind that we are only building a map from string 20, we can easily implement um, our solution in one line. So what happens here is we are using the Tumab Rec instance that knows how to convert the tail. Um, and we just, we don't have to worry about it. We just pass the tail to the implicit and it will find the right implicit to do the job. We then use the um, witness um, implicit to get the name of the field. And then the actual value needs some thinking. So the head of the age list is an option. So what we can do with options is map on them. And we map because in case there is a none, we want to keep the none. In case there is a sum, we want to do something on the element inside it. So in case of a sum, we take the element um, inside it. We pass it to the generic that knows how to convert that element to a generic representation. And then we pass the result to the generic that knows how to recursively convert the head of the age list to a map from string 20. We then defined, it's not on this slide, but we defined again a convenience class, um, and we can just do atom data dot to map, and that's our beautiful map over there. Cool. So now that we have a map, let's assume we updated a field, and we have to go back to a case class. Well, this is just mirroring the previous implementation. It has a bunch of implicits and um, some logic to deal with, um, with the map. Now, in this case, we are taking a map from string 20 and we return an option of an age list. So the meaning of the option is it is a sum of an age list if the conversion was successful, but it returns none if the conversion failed. I don't have enough time to go into detail on that one. You'll just have to trust me that this works. Um, but this was far from perfect, right? We didn't have any uh, type safety in this solution. We didn't have any mechanism in place to prevent us from replacing an int with a string, for example, because we were using any inside the map. And if you remember from the beginning of this talk, I showed you how the new value comes in the body of the request. So we had no information about, um, about the field. But we're still ready you know, to, to keep work uh, on this and find a better um, implementation or just build on that. So how did this all end? So we had this very nice, beautiful PR with shapeless, ready to go. And as sometimes happens, uh, my work caught the attention of other teams, and someone came over and told me, you know, your implementation is really nice, but it looks very similar to what Cersei is doing behind the scenes. So in case you don't know, Cersei is yet another library for um, JSON library for Scala. And Cersei is very powerful, and it had this very cool update feature that did exactly what we wanted. So long story short, I closed my shapeless PR and just rewrote everything in under two hours using Cersei. Um, that's kind of sad. Um, but we've all learned something from this. New and shiny is fun. And it's very easy to get distracted and reinvent the wheel using cool libraries and spend two weeks doing it. Um, so I really believe this wasn't a waste of time. I'm still not an expert in shapeless, but you know, now I know a little bit more. And next time I'm going to use it, I'm going to be better at making decisions. And if you end up doing something similar, just make the most out of it and just make sure you share your learnings with um, the rest of us. I have here for you uh, a link to the shapeless book I've been using. It's very good, it's free, please check it out. And this is um, the code, so a link to the repo where you can find the code. Um, yeah, I definitely encourage you to have a look. Uh, it is a very good exercise and maybe it will inspire you to build something new. And you know, if you have any questions, uh, you now know where to find me. Thank you very much.